Munson Seed, host of today's Health IQ. I am partnering with all the individuals that you see in the boxes, and my co-host is Dr. Stevenson, epidemiologist. Mm -hmm. Today, we want to talk about the role that education in this pandemic and the outset of where we see epidemiologists and scholars and individuals who study the impact of health disparities on our community like Dr. Holden. So if you'd all take two minutes to introduce yourselves to the audience, uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Holden. Ms. Holden, you, you gotta put some respect on my name now, brother. I said doctor the first time you didn't say anything. I know that you've gotta be a fire breathing dragon to be involved in health, public health for sure. But well, we love you. Sure. We appreciate everything that you do. And uh, most wouldn't pick Flint and you have. So we admire you for your commitment to our community. Yeah, so I'm Not Deborah before. Verholden. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm Deborah Verholden. I'm an epidemiologist by training. Uh, I feel old because I got my PhD from Johns Hopkins in epidemiology about 21 years ago. Um, don't let the youth fool you. I've been at this game for a really long time. Never thought that what I was preparing for was what we were gonna define as the you know, worst health crisis that we had faced uh, in, a, in a single time period in a hundred years. But I'm an epidemiologist by training. I'm the Associate Dean for Public Health Integration at Michigan State University. And I'm also the Director of the Division of Public Health and the Director of the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, which is funded by the NIH, the National Institute of Health, or the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Super. Dr. Stevens. Oh, hello everyone. I am Dr. Kenyatta Stevens. I am an infectious disease epidemiologist and I am an adjunct professor of public health um, at two universities right now. Super. And our dear esteemed Dr. Uh, from Howard University, if you would in introduce yourself to our audience as well. Sure, thanks for having me. I'm Wayne Frederick. I'm the president at Howard University. I'm also a cancer surgeon uh, who still practices as well. So you are all aware of the health disparities. There is a new vision that we have to have for our community. Um, for those who are getting ready to travel, some are, are I guess, maybe what, four months away from getting ready to start a new uh, college year for both of you who teach. What should our prospective institutions look forward to do and how can they approach even the careers, because many have graduated now, how can they approach their careers given this pandemic? Uh, Dr. Stevens. Oh, that's a wonderful question and one in which I get quite often from my students and um, graduate students in public health that I actually mentor. So um, with a lot of the changes going on with COVID-19 and a lot of um, businesses basically downsizing. And so one would think that, you know, public health would be the, the right building that they could actually find work, but actually that's not, that hasn't been the case for a lot of students. And um, I've just been reaching out to them, giving them um, other avenues as far as fellowships, but as far as like just finding direct work right now, even though um, this is a public health heavy moment right now, um, the jobs just aren't there. Dr. Holt. I think Dr. Stevens is, is right on the money, but I do think something that's come out of this is you know we saw the dissolution of critical offices that would have been staffed by public health personnel. Um, I'm in Michigan uh, of the 80 plus counties that we have, uh, a significant proportion of them do not have anybody with public health credentials in them. I think what this season has given rise to is we now see the critical need for public health. The thing I love about public health is it crosses so many sectors, right? So there's the, interplay between health and wealth and education. And people talk a lot about things called social determinants of health and some of these other topics. So I think we've all realized now the very critical need for these transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary trained professionals. But Dr. Stevens is right, there hasn't been quite the demand because we haven't had to deal with what we're dealing with right now. 
But I, what I'm hoping is that what's on the horizon and what this gives way to is an increased demand for well-trained public health professionals. Doctor, Dr. Frederick. Sure, you know, um, again, I think uh, the landscape has changed significantly. Howard undergrad, uh, our undergrad campus sends more African-Americans to medical school than any other institution in the country. And we have a medical school and a hospital. And I think um, that there's a very awkward juxtaposition that's occurring. So while we're trying to make sure we fill that pipeline, the reality is um, this coming fall, I would say in the next 60 to 90 days, depending on how well our hospital systems recover, um, we actually are going to see hospitals fail and we're going to see hospitals that are actually conducting layoffs and furloughs because the revenue hit that hospital systems have taken as we have shut down our elective um, offerings uh, may not necessarily come back as quickly. And I think that's one thing for us to look at. During the pandemic, um, lots of people were dying at home. More people died at home uh, during these few months than did about a year ago. And that may be from people not wanting to go seek care, not having the availability of it, or just being um, apprehensive and dying from either uh, the COVID-19 uh, infection or some chronic illnesses. We have a master's in public health program uh, at Howard, which is um, new. And I, I agree with the prior two speakers. Um, we need more officials like this. But the reality is we, we also have to train a broader swath of healthcare providers and others um, in public health. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do. We, we need more interprofessional education uh, around that issue. Uh, we, Howard has the only dental school and only pharmacy school in the district. So when we train pharmacists and we train dentists, a lot of what we're trying to embed in them as well, depending on where they go, is that we want them to participate in those counties and those uh, border healthcare systems as well, so that they can really have a true impact outside of just their uh, clinical activity. You know, some of these young people and their parents have to have new dialogue about uh, selecting the type subjects they're getting ready to study. I think this is a huge request now that the dialogue be much more attentive. They're definitely going to have to prepare for how they study. What do you suggest that conversation? Because for me, I want parents to know, because some might say, I don't know. How do you juxtapose this with the future and the future of both healthcare and attending uh, a university? Uh, we'll start with uh, you, Dr. Frederick. Sure, you know, I, I'm actually living this right now. I have a 15 year old son who's about to be 16 in a couple of weeks on June 13th. And my daughter who's 13 is about to graduate from middle school virtually, uh, albeit and she'll turn 14 in, in July. Uh, she's left-handed. So I, I'm praying that she become a surgeon. I haven't seen a technically um, <laughs> bad left-handed surgeon. Uh, they both have some interest in the STEM areas as an example, but just like with them, I'm talking to students who are coming to Howard about something different. I'm talking to them about what is their mission in life and not so much their major. Because I think unlike my generation where we very early on were focus, focused on a major and a certain field of study, what we're seeing today are, are people who are pluripotent in their talent base and in the expression of that talent base. So we have students at Howard who are political science majors, uh, theater arts minor. Uh, I love that, uh, you know, how they bring those different aspects together, I think is critical. And what they have exposed, uh, what they have available to them is a different level of exposure. And, and so what I would encourage parents to do is to make sure that students explore as broadly as possible uh, the breadth of their talents and don't necessarily shut down some aspect of their talent because it does not fit the mold as we see it today. Uh, but because of the, the, the intersectionality of so many of these issues as has been articulated uh, by the two previous speakers, you really want people with a broader breadth and knowledge of the world around them in order for them to be able to impact uh, the world ultimately. And so I, I hope that parents will continue to expose uh, students uh, as broadly as possible and not necessarily get them too pigeonholed into a particular specialty. And even if they do and they have an early interest, 
to encourage them uh, to be open-minded, especially during college, about taking classes that would really open them up to things they otherwise wouldn't see. Dr. Stevens? Um, yes, I really agree um, with Dr. Frederick because um, teaching in a master in um, public health program and um, we had an influx of students into um, one of the universities that I teach at just um, a few months ago because they do have rolling admissions. And these are um, people, I have three students that actually work at Disney and Disney is paying for them now to have degrees in public health because they realize the value of public health degrees when it comes to um, a public park, um, as, you know, as Disney. But um, I also work with um, a lot of high school students. Um, I'm a member of Apple Cap App Sorority Incorporated, and we have a signature program um, called Hashtag Cap, which is the college admissions program. And I'm um, the actual lead for my chapter. And so I work with students throughout the year, high school students. Um, and that's one of the main things that I encourage. And that's that they consider um, not just the traditional majors, but look at what they like because th um, whatever they decide to do in college is something that they're pretty much going to be forced with. Why, even if you have to get student loans, why pay for something that you don't like? So, Doctor, I, uh, so I, I agree with both of what the um, uh, speaker said, and I love um, especially what Dr. Frederick said about um, uh, mission versus major. Mm -hmm. And to echo what Dr. Stevens said about doing what you like, I personally have what I call my three-legged stool for my career. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who has been, I was at Johns Hopkins, that's where I did my undergraduate and graduate. I became a faculty member there and that world is soft money research. So, mm -hmm. you know, you wrangle up your own supper. We call it the eat what you kill model. Right. So basically, I paid my salary out of my own grants, even though I had a salary that was designated by the university. I paid that my salary myself. And what I realized with every grant that I got is that I was on the hook for seeing that grant all the way through. And so this notion of do what you love, do what you're passionate about, like, you know, university president, epidemiologist, like right on, on the money. The other two pillars of my stool is to also think of it as a Venn diagram, right? You got three circles coming together. So it's what I love to do, what I'm passionate about, what I'm really good at, what I'm qualified to do. It's also what I can get paid for and not just get paid for it, but get paid well. Cause I also have aspirations in my own life. I don't feel like I have to make contributions in the world and be a pauper in the process. And then the third leg of the stool, which is really important to me and why I ended up not in medicine, but in public health. And I think medicine is phenomenal. I work with a lot of my medical colleagues and physicians. I was a pre-med major, but it's fulfilling on something that's wanted and needed out in the world. And so if there is no right now need or demand for it, then the question I would ask young people to ask themselves is, are you willing to create a demand or a want or a need for something? So my three pillars are do what you love, what you're passionate about, very consistent with what the other uh, panelists have shared, do what is wanted and needed in the world and do what I can get paid to do in a way that gives me the lifestyle that, you know, honors the life that I want to live. So I, I think we can have it all. Well, I love that we can have it all. I, I, I like the fact that we probably want to define mission for um, many students because I think it's not very obvious. I love the exposure, uh, uh, Dr. Frederick. I, I definitely believe in getting paid uh, and it should be part of the principle. Most need to understand what that means because it, it, it's not really obvious and it's often hidden in our community. You know, kill what you eat. That's a, you learn that. So we need to share that when you get in the door. People are gonna want you to pay for performance. They're no longer just gonna want you to be there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's great. But on a, another sense, what do you anticipate the new reality for this whole roommate students being at college, working on projects together, uh, social distancing, and I'm just getting my first girlfriend. What's that dynamic during this moment for students who might make it to college, if you think we'll get there, uh, Dr. Frederick, by August? Yeah, it, I'm, no, without a doubt, it's gonna be different. Uh, but one of the things I think about young people today that, that we 
probably sell them short on is that uh, they are very, very dynamic. And they also, this is probably the most altruistic generation uh, probably in the past 75 years. If you look at all the markers of uh, the things that we look at uh, from a public health point of view and, and other things in terms of what they do, their concern for the world, their concern for people around them, uh, they're very high on altruism. They're very high on, on taking care of others, on what's happening with others. They also have more information than any other generation has had about things that are far remote from them. So they know more about Bangladesh today and issues that may be occurring there than the average student did several years ago. So as a result of that, I think uh, the way they interact with one another, yes, we have a generation that are hooked to devices, um, but what we see at Howard as well is they also are hooked to each other. Um, even if some, a lot of that communication is through their devices, they'll tell you right now as they're doing summer school online, um, they would love to be in the same place with each other, even if they have to stay six feet away and wear a mask. Um, the nature of the human condition is interaction. It's not isolation. Uh, yes, there are some of us that are more introverted than others, but the reality is uh, even introverted people will tell you they like being around people. They just don't want to speak. Uh, let us somebody else speak, but they'll sit in the room. They want to be part of the conversation. So we also <laughs> have to recognize that you're not going to take that away. And what a college campus does is it teaches all of us how to do that. And we all adapt over time based on our personalities, our experiences as to how we do that. And I think that's what you'll see now. You'll see that people are going to be creative, I think, especially on Howard's campus, uh, where you know some of these kids are so fashion conscious, the mask are going to be a, a bit of a fashion uh, symbol, uh, where sneakers might have been in the past, uh, you know, caps may have been. I think people's masks are going to be part of their expression, you know, for that. And even with social distancing, I think people are going to relish uh, that opportunity. It's going to be different. There's no doubt about it. Um, we, we may not have as many roommates. We, we may not have triples. So you may not have two besties, but you may still end up with only one. And so all of those things will be different, but I still think uh, it's going to be a great experience for them. And something that also that will shape how they think about that interaction going forward. That human touch is the other aspect of this that I think is going to be very, very interesting. We've probably taken some of that for granted over time, but I think now that human touch, face-to-face -face interaction is going to mean so much more in our society in general and our campuses are going to embody that. Dr. Stevens? Uh, yes, that's a question that I, I get often too about what does um, college in the fall look like and is it safe, especially from a lot of parents of new um, freshmen for the fall and just parents of students who are returning. Um, especially when you attend a school, like, you know, I'm a Howard grad, yay. And I, um, <laughs> it's like in some of my biology lectures, it may have been two or 300 of us. So they just wanted to know how does that look like? I mean, what does that look like? And how do students still um, are able to receive that same level of education, but with precautions as far as like, you know, um, COVID-19. And so, um, it really depends on the school. I know um, I've spoken with some schools and they're going to do more so of a hybrid learning. Um, there's not going to be um, a lot of um, the more packed auditoriums um, as before. So um, some of us who are older, who are, who are used to that experience, <laughs> um, the students coming now may not have it. And um, but it, it's definitely, um, it, it's going to have to be an adaptable situation. I like that. I'll challenge most of that because I, I, I think that that's not what I'm seeing. But uh, I'm going to let one more person throw that in, Dr. Holden. Well, I, honestly, I mean, the epidemiologists sort of think alike. So <laughs> like yeah. to the epidemiologists, you know, and, I, and, and respectfully, Dr. Frederick, yeah. I have such a tremendous empathy for our university leaders because especially as the president of Howard, I just fully acknowledge and honor and appreciate you. I have a niece that's at Howard University. I have many family members who have, you know, sort of it's in some shape or form come through Howard. I just appreciate the vital role that institutions like Howard play. It's so hard for me to digest the conversations that we're ready, right? Because when I look at just the data, the data don't quite tell us that yet. And I understand as a university president, it's not your job 
to necessarily be a pragmatist. And I can appreciate that, you know, to some extent, you know, but I look at, you know, I'm, I'm monitoring the data every day. And when we look at the states, the 12 to 14 states who have, I won't say prematurely reopened, I'll just say have started some reopening or re-engagement process. And I was in Maryland for, you know, I was born in Washington, DC, grew up in Sea Pleasant, Maryland. The, 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 when you look at that part of the country, okay, great, they opened up about two weeks ago. What are we seeing now? They were patting themselves on the back, decrease in cases, decrease in deaths, decrease in hospital admissions. And what has happened, and I knew, and my colleague, Dr. Stevens can say, it would take about two weeks before we would start to see, based on this sort of, what we know about the natural history and the progression of this disease, before we would then see an uptick in cases. And what do you see in the headlines today? Maryland has now sort of lost that early traction and we're now seeing an uptick in cases. So I, I don't envy you, I don't want your job just yet. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Frederick, that's the job you raised your hand for and thank you for what you do, authentically. <laughs> thank you for what you do. I would not want your job, but I just feel like I have a, myself a, a graduating, well, she's now done, a high school senior who's now going to be an entering freshman in college. So I'm dealing with this, not just as a public health professional, but also as a parent. You know, my heart breaks for her because it sounds silly, right? We're in a pandemic. She missed graduation. She missed prom, senior skip day, all of those rites of passage. And then the entry into freshman year in college, I want nothing more for her than to have what that would be for me. And I just don't think the data yet give us enough indication. We don't know enough about this um, virus and the disease to know whether or not with certainty what exactly that's gonna look like. So, you know, for Dr. Frederick and all my other university presidents, I do not envy you during this season. And I know you're doing the best you can, but I, I just don't, I just think we don't have enough yet to say what that's gonna look like. So I'm preparing my daughter that her start of her freshman year is gonna be some more better, different version of what we're doing right now. Well, Dr. Frederick, you know I'm gonna let you respond to that for sure. Sure, sure, no, absolutely. I, I was hoping you would. So I, I wanna be clear, um, I, am, I am actually uh, pretty pragmatic about this. Uh, what we're doing right now at Howard is we have not made a final decision as to what we're gonna do. We I started a task force that's looking at uh, was back into DC from 44 states and 71 countries, all of the inherent risk that come with that and, and how do you get them socially distanced, et cetera, especially if you're having an issue in our locality at that time. The second scenario is gonna be some hybrid in which we de-densify the campus. We offer uh, people with comorbidities like myself. I would have been that student. I came to Howard because I have sickle cell anemia. And so I came all the way from Trinidad to attend Howard and that was a big reason. Um, if I were my, you know, six, the qualitative aspect of them, you know, figuring out how to interact. Uh, and I think what, um, you know, I'm, I'm answering to is the fact that it is a difficult decision and it will primarily uh, depend on the health and safety as the very, very first um, aspect of that. We're probably about 75 to 90 days away uh, from, you know, that happening. And I think if we look back 90 days, in our retroscope, uh, there's some things that have happened here in the, in the past 90 days that I don't, I'm not sure we would have predicted uh, would have unfolded in this manner. And I think it's the same thing going forward. So as some localities open up and we see those, we're gonna have to respect that. You know, I, I sat in the mayor's reopen DC uh, committee on the equity and um, vulnerable populations. And that is particularly where I'm concerned. I have a lot of professors who are over 70 have comorbidities. So it's not just about the students, but it's about the staff and the faculty they'll interact with as well. While, while the students may do well with you know, some mild infections, uh, our faculty members may not fare so well. So I, I absolutely agree with what was said. This is not uh, by anywhere uh, close to a done deal. We're, we're just in the beginning of trying to make plans and, and, and get there. I, I have to say one other thing though. One unique thing about HBCUs with Pell Grant students is that a lot of times our schools are the safe place for them. And that's also another complication that we have to be thoughtful about, that bringing them is not just a matter of their education, 
but it's a matter of life and a quality of life um, that they may live. And that's also a different kind of responsibility that we carry in, this, in terms of this decision-making as well. Well, I think we find ourselves, did you want to say something, Dr. I just want to add one thing, a, a, a research project that we undertook last year with some medical students that we're following up on this year points exactly to what Dr. Frederick is talking about. It's the same conversation I think we have with a lot of our places of worship and faith institutions, same conversation with HBCUs. These are the trusted anchor institutions in African-American communities and communities of color. Many of these places were created because there was no other place for people to go. And so just the thought that these places become sites for super spread of this virus. And of course, when you look at the data, who fares the best with COVID-19 generally? Young, healthy people with you know, no pre-existing health conditions, et cetera. That's just what the sort of basic data you know, are telling us, but I do appreciate the tremendous, you know, responsibility on these institutions that have been the anchors for our communities mm -hmm. to really, and I feel like this is a time for you to really be at the, the forefront. So I can appreciate because my daughter is not going um, to an HBCU. I'll spare you why. Her first choice was Spelman. That didn't work out for us. That's okay. But, you know, these institutions really are, so we trust Howard University. You know, we trust Howard University in a way that we don't trust predominantly white institutions or other institutions. And so I just really acknowledge and appreciate you, Dr. Frederick, for sort of saying, look, we're staying nimble right now. You know, we have some intentions and some plans to serve our students, but we just, we have to stay nimble and, and actually do what works best for them. So. I, I think you're like the perfect combination of where the institutional priorities come together with what the public health are telling us. I don't know. The uh, outset, you're a young person, your heart's beating uh, very rapidly. Uh, you had never seen uh, as many beautiful Black uh, women and men in your lifetime, and you make it to DC. Um, What's the message? I mean, because there doesn't appear to be a, a guiding message. And I'm afraid even listening to Dr. Holden, the epidemiologist, that many young people might let the fact that they can push risk based on the fact that they could survive and not be as thoughtful. Uh, Dr. Frederick can bring a, a, a the COVID to a professor. I, I think, how can we get a guiding conversation even in that, you know, because I'm not sure young people discuss their risky behavior. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a good point as well. Um, but I'll tell you again, and maybe I can be cynical about the young people because of the two who live in my own house. Um, but I really think that they have a lot more empathy than we think. I think what we have to do is to spend time communicating with them what the expectations are, what the data is. Um, you know, before the pandemic really took hold, I met with uh, some students uh, in, in my conference room, maybe I think it was in February. And the level of skepticism about this pandemic uh, overwhelmed me. 4.0 GPA students from economics, biology, and they were largely very skeptical that this was real, that it would get to the US, that it would impact their lives in any way, shape or form. And at the time, you know, I myself didn't know, I told them that I was concerned and that if it did come here, knowing what I know about our health system, uh, we could have a crisis. And I remember they were a bit dismissive, but then I go back and I think about where were they getting their information from? And they were getting their information from an uninformed media. They were getting the information from a media that was running behind a president who himself was not expressing uh, a concern about that. So we as leaders in our community have a responsibility to communicate what's going on. And so I've really pushed out a lot of communications to our students about all kinds of details, the finances of the university, uh, mm -hmm. the health aspect of what we're seeing in the hospital, how many patients, because I think that that's what we have to say to our young people. And you make a very good point. And I think it drives home, it drove home at commencement. It was one thing to cancel commencement, 
But then when I explained to them that for my first graduation, my grandmother got on an airplane for the first time in her life to come to this country to witness my graduation. And if I had to do it over again in the middle of a pandemic to protect her life, I wouldn't have her do it. And I think when you start speaking to them about that, it becomes real and they recognize their responsibility. So my first letter that went out to the community was a letter titled The Communal Good. And the fact that we all have to be acting on behalf of each other in a circumstance like this, especially when you have so much asymptomatic uh, people walking around that are potential carriers. And I think that the young people will step up uh, where appropriate. Dr. Stevens. Um, yes, I agree because I'm on um, all of the Howard University alumni sites and um, some of the student sites just monitoring just to see what the, the temperature is and just what they're saying. And um, Dr. Frederick is right, like their, their moral compass has really increased since um, COVID, but I can't say that about, other, about students at other um, HBCUs. And um, I, I think that going to an HBCU and having friends um, that have attended HBCUs, we should really try to get like some type of um, HBCU task force for COVID um, for also that all the HBCUs are sending the same message. Well, um, whereas I don't just want Howard students to be safe. I want all students um, across HBCU campuses um, to be safe. And so um, I've spoken again with parents who have students at different universities or different HBCUs and they're like, you know, this university is saying this and this is saying this. So um, I personally, personally would like to see a cohesive message go out um, from HBCUs. And also um, just to keep reinforcing the message to students um, that they need to take this really seriously and not to let their guard down just because campus is open doesn't mean the threat is, isn't still there. Dr. Holm. Yeah, and the other thing, and I, I think Dr. Frederick's example is really great. He talked about coming with a, a pre-existing condition, sickle cell, that affects my family as well. And so if you were a young person having to make that decision, I, we have eczema in my family. They think potentially eczema might have some autoimmune, right. you know, uh, relationship. There's so much that we don't know about, about how this virus moves. And so I think about the, 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 the youngest COVID case that we had, I, I talked about this a little bit this morning with a five-year-old in Detroit. Nobody could have anticipated that. It was secondary complications, et cetera. But even this notion that younger people are somehow immune to it. I looked at that New York Times article that had the 1% the of cases and their names and I couldn't help it. My heart immediately took me to the ages. And I started looking not at the ages 70, 80, et cetera. I started looking at the 19, 32, 43. I saw a lot of people who were close to my age, but how I cognitively process information and then how that shapes influence and influences my thoughts and feelings and, and actions and behaviors. That is very different than an 18 year old. So I do think this notion of the sort of collective voice of HBCUs like Dr. Stevens was pointing to and what um, also Dr. Frederick is trying to do is really important. If you can create a culture at Howard where we really are simultaneously practicing personal responsibility but also operating from collective good, like that's the kind of conversation that we need to be elevating. Well, I'm going to bring a couple of questions from Facebook, but I will say this in terms of consistent conversation, um, Dr. Frederick, the importance to me of having um, alumni, uh, like Laz Alonzo is a friend of mine, and uh, what's the brother that, that was in Black Panther? Chadwick Boseman. Right, Chadwick, that's right. I know you know that name, but um, I, I think we've got to get Chadwick Taraji, all the, the HBCUs, gods, if you will, that, that are out there to begin to have this one 
conversation with video. I'm going to actually send to your team uh, something that Lincoln Center put together. And it's a very collective, here, share these videos so that all of our people, because what I'm afraid of, and, and I respect all of you, obviously we're here together as a community, but there ain't one communication happening in my community right now. Like y'all might be saying something, but it, I didn't play the video because uh, my board suggested that we not play the video, um, but there was nothing to suggest to me. And I live in Atlanta and I'm a Morehouse grad. And I know that there were college educated incoming freshmen at these pool parties. And I am afraid that our loving children that we trust to feel a little turn up when they're gone, you know, and, and, and I love the idea, but we need to make sure collectively you and I harness one message because there still isn't one message in our community. I, I would challenge the NAACP. Everybody keeps coming to a, a conversation. I would challenge any group right now, Dr. Frederick, Dr. Holden, there is not one message coming from our community because everybody thinks it's an option to wear a face mask. Every person I know thinks it's an option. I mean, and, and, and if we don't have options like that and then our people of influence aren't calling out the selfishness in taking that option, we might as well just follow the man who suggested that you want to drink some bleach or, or a little uh, uh, ammonia. They, they just kind of get you a shot and hope for the best when you wake up or don't. You, you know, your, your, listen, your point is well taken. At Howard, we formed uh, something called the Black Coalition Against COVID for that very reason. And I would admit it's a local um, activity and it's, it's activated around DC. It involves my sociology department, my psychology department, my public health department, college of medicine. And, and, and the reason we're bringing all of these people together is because we recognize that framing messages is important. So we've had a wide variety of people do PSAs. We've had Google musicians. We've had the chair of my uh, health sciences committee and my board of trustees who is a former department of health um, director, uh, Reed Tuxen. Uh, so we've had a wide variety of people come together. Um, and one of the reasons we, we did this is because we felt that testing was under, uh, underperformed in our neighborhood and we had to convince people why. So we stood up testing in uh, Southeast DC for that reason. And the second reason is we're very concerned about contact tracing. Uh, it, it's one thing for you to simply say, I'm going to you know, uh, show up at your door and let you know that you're COVID positive and ask you who you've been with and around the past 10 to 14 days. In our community, uh, if you just simply train contact tracers without any cultural competence or you don't utilize the churches and the interfaith uh, community in these neighborhoods, uh, it's going to fail. So I, I agree, we have to get um, a, a lot of these people to do that. But I, I also want us to recognize that yes, we have a pandemic and there's an acute need for this. But the reality is in our society in general, we need more of this. We need more of us supporting each other and what we're trying to do in order to move the needle. And there just isn't enough of that. And hopefully one silver lining, if there is a silver lining uh, in any of this is we can get this right and hopefully carry it on and over into a wide variety of things from small black businesses to what we do with arts and entertainment, what we do with sports. I mean, all the other issues that trickle down um, from this, how we support our HBCUs or not, uh, you know, all of those are things that I think generally you can bring that audience. And, and, and the last thing I'll say, it doesn't have to be just the Laz Alonzo's and the Taraji Henson's. Uh, they do a lot, there's no doubt, but it has to do uh, with every one of us in our community who has enough to help um, others and to make sure that we're consistently stepping in and stepping up. There are DC school kids who went on distance learning, no supervision in the home, no laptop, no Wi-Fi, right? Um, somebody's going to suggest holding that kid back a grade rather than standing up something this summer to help that student catch up. And we can't wait for somebody else to come and do this. Uh, those are the types of things that Howard has to, to do and participate in, in my opinion. All right, Luke, we're going to hold you to that. Uh, 
Dr. Holden looks like she has something to say. I have no poker face. I'm really trying. And you seem like you like to grapple. And I promised you earlier we were going to grapple. So I want to push back a little bit. Can we do that? I'm not. I'm waiting for you. You know, I'm here you say for you. One, okay, so so now look, if I had on sleeves, I would be rolling them up. So, so you talk about one message, okay? And so what's the one message coming from the white community? I can't deal with them right now. Like they, that done, right, right now, that's my issue. I, I don't, they, they already had a message. They, they have a message. They have a message from here in Georgia. I'm in Georgia. They have a message. Come get your nails done. There is a message. What, what I'm sharing are, are clear uh, understanding with you, Dr. Holden. I'm not even bringing them into this consideration because this is our community at this moment. It well, is clear. Let me, let, let me tell you. They, yeah. they back the trucks up to the budget and they got 20 million for Shake Shack. They clearly don't have a problem during the pandemic. That, that's, they, we can't even talk about them on this show. You got to roll that back, call your person back and put them sleep. We can't talk about them. They, they don't need money. They print it every day. They got the entire stock market. So that ain't what we're talking about. They, every airline, airline got a bailout check. And then, and then fire people. We can't talk about them. Except the majority of white people don't live that experience. I have a lot of white colleagues and friends and community members right here in Flint, Flint who had to drink the same water. See, Flint went through what Flint went through, not because it's a black city. Flint is only about 54, 55% black. Flint through, went through what it went through because it is a low economic city that lost its political power and has significant economic divestment. So let's not pretend there's a, the majority of white people are not eating the crap that's being peddled to them by white privilege. There's a whole class of white people. There's no one message for any group. I just don't wanna see an excess burden placed on the black community that we've gotta have one message because it doesn't honor the great variety and heterogeneity within our community. What might resonate with an older population might not resonate with the younger population. What might make sense for an educated population might not make the same sense to somebody who's reading as a 35 year old adult below the sixth grade reading level. So we talk about this like notion of sort of one message and what we wanna communicate. This is a, the, our community is so complex and so varied. I don't want us to think that somehow we've missed the mark or dropped the ball. I don't wanna put a, 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 a wage on the black community that we're not willing to pay I, in I any you. other I, I got you, but I wanna be real clear because that we've been talking about this for probably six weeks. When I say one, uh, um, message, I do want one message. Because it's too too optional for people to be, um, if I listen to one more sad story about a barbecue and, and you invited people over and then you didn't have no mask. Like when I say one message, I'm saying, you know, what's the protocol? It, 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 it's, it's, it's like, we've got to have some rules at this point or we're going to totally lose the game. So I'm not, I'm a, when I, when I say even using, I can, I can go down to the Migos. It really doesn't matter to me who, as it relates to, but if my community doesn't come together on this particular issue to talk to young people that we love with the fact that we now can make a quick video with every demographic that you're talking about. So I'm not letting anybody, because Howard has had a phenomenal impact on Hollywood. They've had a phenomenal impact everywhere. But we got to have one message. I can't listen to another barbecue after Memorial Day and they say, well, we, we did social distancing without masks, but we ate together. I'm, I'm like, which one is it, Doc? Are we saying we don't need to wear masks or we do need to wear masks? If we don't, maybe Dr. Frager, I got it wrong. They're going to be in class with or without masks. I need to know which one, because I need one message. So this is that moment of one message. This is what your brother means, Dr. Holden, with one <laughs> message. I want to make sure we're going to be in yeah, class so I, with or without masks. Yeah, I, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm with Dr. Holden a bit on this. I think we, we plan on having students wear masks. But again, I, I, I want to be clear. 45 days from now, you might have me back on here on a panel, and we may all decide at this point based on where the country is, that we need to be back and stay at home, or we had another extreme where we don't even think that that's necessary anymore. So I want to be clear about that. And, and I like, I, I, on, I'm not going to push back as much on the one message as much as 
I, I probably would just change that a little bit because I think to Dr. Holden's point, that there's not a one size fits all, but there's a one community approach that probably embraces well, Say that again more. one more time so she can hear that. No, I, 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 I'm saying that there's a one community approach that embraces all, that kind of brings us all together. And, and that's why we use everybody from Google Musicians. Um, we, we, you know, we, we had poets do a poet slam the other night. I mean, we're using every technique, but we're using us. I, I think the primary message is that we have to step up and step in. We didn't cause these things, these big disparities, but that's not the point. The point is if we stand by, they're only gonna get worse. Maternal mortality in African-American women is not gonna go away because there was a pandemic. It's only gonna get worse. So if we fall asleep at the wheel right now, to your point, some of the things that are already bad are gonna get worse and we're gonna fall further behind. And I like Dr. Holden's point about wealth because part of this is generational wealth. And what is going to hurt us when we look at the impact on the economy is this is going to set us back even further. So this issue about the college education could be very critical. We could look up five, 10 years from now, and all of a sudden, because of what this did to our communities, the number of fathers and mothers it took out, aunts and uncles who would put together and send us all to church, uh, send us the church money, sorry, to send us to college, as that group gets wiped out, we could really have a setback here. We could look up and the number of African-American students who are now choosing college could fall apart. And as Dr. Stevens said earlier, it, you really want to make sure that students are getting a message about what their options are and, and what they can do. And I, I am worried, I have to admit, not just from the health impact. I think the number of people who have died at home, when we really stop and we calculate all the numbers, we put them all together, and the number of people who are going to die in the next six to 12 months, not from COVID, but because their diabetes got worse, their hypertension got worse, we are at risk for some significant change in the landscape of what could happen to us in the next six to 12 months. So we, we have to come out with a message. I agree. Uh, but I would just say, I think our entire community needs to take responsibility and, and really come together. Around. But uh, Dr. Stevens. Yes, I, I agree. And I've, said on um, panels before that at this point, because um, we are seeing an issue where people with pre-existing conditions and comorbidities don't want to go to the hospital or, or they're afraid to get on public transportation because they don't have cars or they can't afford, they've lost jobs, they can't afford Uber or what have you. So I recommended that we bring the health, bring healthcare into the community, even if it's setting up, you know, in local churches, just so we can establish um, some consistency and some of that same messaging that we were talking about, about mask or, you know, I know people um, just in Georgia, living in Georgia, they didn't know um, that there's still a shelter in place for the elderly and um, what they call medically fragile people until June 12th. So that message wasn't enforced or expressed enough to that it reached our community. So there has to be some other outlets, other um, than social media that our communities are referring to that may not be giving accurate um, information or all of the information. So that's one of the things that I think that we should really take into consideration. Yeah, the, the bods drop, dropped in uh, when you were talking today, uh, Dr. Holden, the, the little conservative bods. It's, it just wanted to put some disinformation in the conversation today. There are questions from Facebook, uh, Dr. Holden, about contact tracing and what we should do and what people need to know. So I'm going to ask that to you and then to Dr. Stevens and then come back to you, Dr. Frederick. So what people need to understand about contact tracing is contact tracing all starts with testing. If you want to trace contact, you first got to be able to identify a case. I don't think this has really settled in for people, right? So to be able to contact trace, you first have to identify somebody as a case. There's so much misinformation, bad information, and flat out wrong and detrimental and, and life-threatening information out here. There's so much noise. So for us to actually contact trace, the first thing we have to do is be able to readily identify a case of disease. Yeah. Who is infected with the virus? Look at the data. Most of the states, when they started out testing, they weren't even collecting 
the kind of information that you would need to even notify the person who took the test that they were positive, let alone collecting data on race to be able to say, I'm a hand stalker, I've been told not to do that. Let alone the data to be able to say the race of the person so we could identify and understand disparities both in testing and then in cases and then do the proper work to then ensure the protection of that person and all of the people that they had come in contact with. People don't even understand about testing. There are two types of tests that are available on the market. One test for the presence of the virus and one test for the presence of antibodies. Mm -hmm. They have different uses. They have different utility. They're uh, important and have different metrics, i.e. different ability to do what they say they do depending on where you are in the disease. But there's, again, so much misinformation, so much bad information, people don't even know. We have a case in Flint where they went from doing the, the test that tests for the virus, an mm -hmm. RNA test, a PCR test, many different names for it. And it used to be that somebody administered it and they had to stick the swab way far up your nose to get a good sample. Now we're moving to self-administration because we're doing drive-through testing. Well, if you don't get the swab in there good enough, or if you grab cells from the outside of your nose, you end up with a bunch of false positives. People think they're positives. Then they get a test from their doctor. The doctor administers it three days later and it comes up positive and they think it's because of how the test was administered. Not even realizing that in fact, what happened is you had three more days for virus to show up and you were in fact positive. There's 8 million variables out here that are happening. So in lieu of just the message, I feel like where do we actually get credible, trusted information out from sources that make sense in multiple formats that reach people where they are? Old people in the church like to get stuff in the mail. Young people like to get stuff on, not just social media. I'm evidently finding out social media, it varies by age. Facebook is for the old, Instagram is for the young, TikTok is for the real young and savvy. Like, there's so many pieces to this. Forums like this are our opportunity to unpack it and sort of figure it out. But we've got to do a much better job because if we can't properly identify people and we have people that are apprehensive to even go get testing because they have valid mistrust of a system that has failed them and wronged them in the past, we'll never be able to slow the spread in our community. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna have epidemic waves. It'll go down and then it'll go back up and then it'll go down and then it'll go back up. And we'll be dealing with this for the next year. Dr. Stevens, right quick. And we know there's two tests. Uh, obviously somebody said in Facebook, human behavior is hard to change and it's confusing with all the different messages within and outside our community. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I was speaking on before. I post daily on my Instagram um, page about the numbers and how to interpret the numbers and just making sure that there are questions um, that I'm a resource and that people, I've had people that I didn't know to reach out from, reach out to me from all over the country just asking questions and what does this mean? And, you know, um, I have this or, um, as far as like testing. So I even put up a graphic of what the different tests were and how to interpret the test and what the results mean, just so it was something that the community could share. I know I, my reach is only so far, but once you put out credible data and let um, the community know where they can get credible data, then that's one step. And I also encourage them about testing if they're gonna get tested to make sure that they're, um, counties are being um, counted um, or the ethnicity or race because here in Georgia we have 10,000 over 10,000 cases with unknown race or ethnicity and and we have about 5,000 cases with unknown counties so when we're talking about tracing the next hot spot or uh, or an ethnic group or a, a people um, that that would need some immediate attention as far as like healthcare for COVID Georgia itself is dropping the ball and I live in Georgia, so I, I give those numbers um, more so readily than others, but I have helped um, people in other um, states to actually interpret their data as well. All right, we've got one minute for each of you to give a message to our community regarding COVID and our community. One minute, one message. 
One message? Your message, Dr. Ho. Well, I was like, let's whisper y'all and get our message together. <laughs> my, and literally, I've had a hard time trying to get one message in my own family. So my own personal message would be everybody stay home, stay put, stay tight. Like this is, this is going to require some patience and some prudence. And that's a message that most people can't digest. So in the absence of people being willing to just stay home and stay put, people need to stay safe. You know, you wearing a mask is as much as to protect me from you as it is you from me. So I really think people just need to stay put. If people were willing to do that, what we'll do is shorten the span of how long we have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. If we could get the case rate down in our community sufficiently low, we could actually get through this and get back to some semblance of whatever this new re-engagement and the new normal will look like. In the absence of that, we're just going to be on a roller coaster that's never ending. So Dr. my message is stay home and stay safe. She, she, Dr. Frederick, she took 15 seconds of your one minute, but we got to love our oh, Flint Detroit girl. I, I give you back 15 seconds and give Kenyatta another 15. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, all our actions need to be motivated by love, uh, love for one another and love for ourselves. And if we do that, then that's our principle. Uh, we're going to take all the necessary precautions to not infect each other and to ensure that we ourselves don't get infected and subsequently infect someone else. So I think it's important that uh, we act with our com communal love uh, for each other and especially for Black people. If you really love Black people and you want to see them thrive, uh, this is your time to step up and you step up by taking personal responsibility and behaving um, in a certain way that helps protect everyone. And, uh, for me, um, as far as like, I know social media has, has been my vice of choice, if you will. Um, my message is always stay encouraged, stay safe and stay home. And I end um, my post with that. And um, even if I don't end it with that, I'll get like, so is it safe? You didn't say like, well, you know, I had um, a follower to reach out and was like, hey, you didn't tell us to stay home today. And I was like, oh, well, I was, it was a copy paste error from, you know, like my message because they're, they're getting lengthy, but that's just it. If you don't have to go out, um, just stay home. Hand washing is still important. That message has kind of fallen to the wayside. Um, you have to wear your mask while outside. You, you have to practice social distancing at all times. It doesn't matter. And don't have a false sense of security because the virus is still real and the numbers are still increasing. Well, last question will be, where can they find credible information that they need to track? And I, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, Dr. Holden. Where do you recommend people at least look right now for credible information? I honestly think the most credible information is coming at the local level. Because when you talk about credible information, who are the people that you trust? I will not throw out the name of some big organization. I will say, who are the people locally that you trust? The data that's being generated out of your local community, through your faith community, your local health department, your mayor's office, et cetera. And if you don't trust the mayor's office, don't trust them right now. Who are, whoever are your already trusted, credible messengers. I just know for a fact that many of us are working round the clock. I work 16, 20 hour days. It was a treat for me to put on a little bit of lip gloss to come on this today. But I work 24 seven, I don't have time for TikTok and all that. I'm working, I'm trying to save lives. So I would tell people to go to their local sources. Dr. Stevens, you got 20 seconds. Yes, I agree. Um, just from all of the misinformation that has been reported at the state level, um, no one trusts our CDC data. And then just um, being a, just looking at data, most of the data is behind anyway. So there's like a 10-day lag. So um, just to piggyback on Dr. Holden, who's your, who's your local person? There should be one person um, that you follow. Um, I know on last week's um, panel, we talked about having your trusted sources of people that you go to um, on social media or even... Um, TV that has shown to give out um, adequate and um, correct information. All right. Uh, Dr. Frederick, your recommendation for credible content. Howard.edu. Uh, we, we stood up a, a website uh, embedded in our website with information on COVID-19 that we keep up to date with all the recommendations, for, you know, not just for the local area, but uh, more broadly. But I agree with what 
uh, both Dr. Holden and Dr. Stevens have said, you want to reach out to your trusted local um, people. Well, I would uh, like to thank all of you, my co-host, Dr. Stevens, um, my sister in the fight, because uh, I don't want to be in no fight with nobody that can't fight, uh, Dr. Holden, uh, my, my brother, uh, uh, and, and Dr. Frederick. I want to thank you all for joining Health IQ. I will say love is safe. I'm borrowing from you, Dr. Frederick. Love is safe. So if you believe that you are a loving person and you love the Black community, love is safe. Uh, thank you so much for attending Health IQ. Thank you all. Bye. Peace.